Hello everyone, I hope you're all taking care of your health and uh, your family during this time of pandemic. I know that dates this video a little bit, but I just want to wish you all well. Uh, I was going to do this as a forward to a continued reading of Nichiren's Gosho on the, uh, the Dainmoku of the Lotus Sutra, but uh, I think... It's kind of a standalone subject. Um, I want to talk briefly about skillful means, expedient devices um, that teaching method, if you will, of the entirety of Buddhism from Shakyamuni Buddha through all of the history of the great bodhisattvas and teachers of uh, getting weird flashes on my camera, so I'm hoping that nothing's wrong here. Once again, um, expedient means. What does that mean? Um, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of popular ways that people try to describe what that means. And in fact, I believe it affects uh, translations of these older texts, old teachings uh, transcribed into words. So I'm going to give you my take on it, and I hope that it clears up some uh, mysticism about this. Think about, we're going to talk about Nichiren's day, but this applies to all of Buddhism. In Nichiren's day, you were dealing with a, uh, a government, a people, a country in transition from empirical, almost uh, religious kind of power over the people um, to a shogunate, a samurai state, where uh, brutality, violence, and uh, the threat of violence, the imposing force, was a compelling uh, force for order and governance. Uh, so in the midst of this, in the midst of a people in the throes of uh, weighing their uh, mysticism, of the world, the universe, with uh, the constant power, read threat, of governance uh, to achieve order, um, along comes this uh, monk uh, trying to get people to realize the same thing that Shakyamuni, thousands of years before him, was trying to get the people of his magical day to understand that the universe, though it is immense and at the edge of our grasp of understanding, is logical, it's reasonable, it's understandable, and more to the point, is at your disposal. <laughs> That's just too huge of an idea for people to grasp, even to this day. So uh, the battleground, if you will, of trying to uh, incorporate the wisdom of Buddhism into one's life is always this reason against magic. And if you don't, I'll give you a contemporary example just to show you. If any of you have watched uh, much television, I don't care where you live, uh, you've seen, uh, and I don't want to single out Toyota here, but it's a great example, the Toyota commercial says, how much, what will you do with all the money you save? <laughs> uh, 
okay, I'm going to spend 50 grand on a car. And you're telling me that when I, I don't have the 50 grand, I have to finance it, first of all. Uh, so I'm going to magically come up with 50 grand, right, through contract and so forth and be indebted to you for the next seven years. But I'm getting such a good deal on this car that not paying 60 grand for this car, I'm somehow getting 10 grand in my pocket? What do you mean all the money I save? I'm not saving any money. What kind of trick of logic is that? Do you see what I'm saying? The rhetoric and the propaganda of magical thinking is ensconced firmly in all our societies and in all our lives. So much so that we we really, most of us don't realize it. So imagine that in the 13th century, the mid-13th century in Japan, remember that in the West, we were still in the throes of Christian crusades. The 4th, 5th, or the 5th, 6th, and 7th were all during Nietzsche's lifetime. Crusades I'm talking about. Uh, and I, I don't know that much about the Muslim world. I don't know what they were. But basically, the world in its entirety was in the throes still, a centuries-long throes, of logic and reason versus magical power play propaganda and thinking. So, you know, the, and I'm going to throw in an example of uh, ancient Buddhism here from the first century BC, uh, Nargarjuna. Nargarjuna was confronting this head on. Bodhisattva Nargarjuna wrote the Majamika. Please uh, find it online, read it. What you will see is an incredibly dissected logic of simple concepts, simple concepts of Buddhism like self, non-self, not non-self, right? Things that in our modern world uh, translators like to talk about as poetic or flowery language. No, you're missing the point. Even that is magical thinking. Is if you read Nagarjuna, uh, you it, first of all, if you have any affinity for logic, mathematics, or or if you like espionage films and those kind of things, where where there is reasoning and and thought processes dissected, um, you will you will just eat Nagarjuna up because he he takes these concepts and breaks them down so meticulously meticulously that uh, there can be there's no no there's no more question by the time you end reading it you will either say yeah but and rely on magical thinking or you will go oh of course I get it those aha moments are are very precious and if you get wrapped up to the 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 um, devices, the the elegant ways in which Buddhist Buddhist writings try to appeal to the magical mind because it surrounds us all the time, and slowly coaxed it, coax it into reasonable thinking. Um, if you if you're not aware that that is what is happening in the writings, then my fear is that you may miss uh, the the truly elegant points. It's, it's like uh, Einstein is often quoted as, as talking about this in regards to um, uh, cherished beliefs during his lifetime, right? Remember, he went through the Second World War. So he saw people struggling in his time with this idea of uh, trust and investment in a magical world um, against hard, brutal, life and death reality. Um, judgment just on his, uh, his cultural reality. Um, even he struggled with it, you know. He he wasn't a militant Jew, but he was Jewish, and the the 
the, the forces at the time that were persecuting him just for that made him question whether he should be magical or, or reasonable. Uh, even Einstein. So uh, think about that. Uh, this is a battle that each of us has to fight today on our own to, to, to eschew that magical comfort zone to a, uh, a reality that is even more astounding, really. And this is, what, and this is why I bring up Einstein, because Einstein would, would talk about this, is that there's no need for a magical, mystical uh, organizer of the universe, creator, if you will, and this same thing Buddhism says, uh, because of just the the elegance and beauty and unfathomable, just the 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 way the universe works, and more importantly, because we can look at it reasonably, how we interact with that universe. We're not victims of it. We're not pushed around by it. We are intimately involved with the way our universe functions, how it exists, how it actually is. This is what Buddhism refers to or is translated as truth. Truth not as a belief, but truth as a reality. This is, this is what's happening. But it's, it's a constant negotiation with our human samsaric imagination to go magical with it. There's no magic in Buddhism. But when you read things, especially like the Daimoku, you, you know, Nietzsche is trying to nail this down here as the astounding reality of the universe and our intimate ownership of it. Here's a super simple way, the Daimoku, of diluting, not diluting, uh, of compressing all of the teaching of Buddhism into a simple, direct invocation of that acuity, awareness, and participation in the creation of our own universe from moment to moment. And even as I say that, our our fanciful mind wants to take those words and go, yeah, it's magical. No, <laughs> it's astounding. Yes, but not magical. The moment you start thinking of your universe, your life, your path in Buddhism as somehow extraterrestrial, as somehow extra normal, as somehow bigger than you. You are relinquishing all of the magnificent power you have to contain this universe. It's yours. This is what the Daimoku is all about. Invoking that intimate unshakable relationship between you and your universe. Nothing is dictating that to you. It's yours. It doesn't come, it's not a power you suck out of the sky. It's not something that you're, you're um, appropriating. It's already there. You're already doing it. But because of the way the human mind works, we're so fascinated by everything that we're unaware that we're doing it. This is, this is the, the tightrope. I hope that helps you understand and that you keep this in mind as you're reading Gosho, as you're studying, that this is what is constantly going on with each bodhisattva, trying to reach their culture in their time, imbued with this same dichotomy. What's really going on versus am I just a leaf in the wind?
being blown around by circumstance and accident. Right? It's tough. It's tough even today. In the 21st century, we're still dealing with this magical thinking. And it's becoming uh, just as blatant as it ever was. I mean, there was a lot of covering up for it. You know, by demonizing other people, we justify our actions, right? Uh, but that demonization is just a clever advertising for we're better, they're not. Why? Because we have this magical thinking and they have that magical thinking and their magical thinking is bad and our magical thinking is better. If you take as your kernel of truth that life as a human, no matter what color, what sex, what country, what culture, is simply life as a human. That there is commonality of being human then from that lens, from that place, all of this other rhetoric is... What? It's invention. It's propaganda. It's, it's advertising. It is not real. It is not truth. And Buddhism is a walk right down the middle of this. This is why it's called the middle way. One of the reasons. Right? All right. So that's a short 15 minutes on expedient means, skillful means, skillful devices. All of those translations are meant to alert you that Buddhism is speaking the language of the people inundated in this magical thinking to slowly be coaxed over to opening with clarity their mind's eye to noticing that, to, know, to then lead them to a greater truth, reality. This is all yours. And you can do with it what you will, no matter the propaganda, the rhetoric, the silliness. Not an easy row to hoe, but with that, I think I can continue with uh, the Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra and have it make a little more sense. Thank you so much for listening. Really, truly appreciate all of you. Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Thank you.